uh, welcome to this week's PowerPoint on genre theory. So in this PowerPoint, we're going to go through some of the key terms that are in your glossary. We're going to recap Steve Neal's genre theory, and we're going to try and link our genre theory to our narrative theory. And the reason for this is when you're doing a media language question in the exam, you are going to need to refer to genre and narrative theory together if you want those high end marks. So today we're going to identify repetition, difference and hybridization in a range of media texts. We're going to apply Levi-Strauss, Neil and Hall's encoding and decoding two genre texts and we're going to show how genre is constructed in a text of your choice so that is going to be the text um, that you choose and you're going to do an analysis of that for me this lesson uh, as always with remote learning please complete the tasks set and hand in by the end of the lesson failure to do the work to an adequate standard will result in you falling behind and potentially being put on referral please use google classroom to show that you've done the work uh, and missed deadlines will result in an amber or red engagement mark for the week, which we really don't want to do. We don't want to be putting you in referral. So just make sure that you keep up to date with the work. So uh, in terms of studying genre, our key terms. Genre is French for type or kind, and it is how we divide things into easily identifiable categories. And we do this according to the elements they share. So in Kiss of the Vampire, we see the moonlight, the castle, the bats, the um, wooden letters or the letters that look like they're made of wood, the red liquid dripping from the point of that V, which is polysemic, indicating either a um, steak or a fang. So it has multiple meanings. It's polysemic um, and also the word vampire, for example. Um, all of those things help us to construct the genre. Uh, so we also construct a genre for the use of characters through the narrative. The iconography, so those are the things that we see in the mise-en-scene and our cultural understanding of them through the setting and through the technical and audio codes. So today I'm going to take you through a little bit of that. First thing I want you to do is list your five favourite films, bands or TV shows. Those of you that are at home, list these and we'll share them next week. Those of you that are in, you need to share them with a partner and see if that person can tell what your favourite genres are. Are they correct? If they can guess what your favourite types of films, bands, TV shows are, then that means you have very clear cut genre preferences, whereas others may be more eclectic and may choose um, things from a wide range of different genres in terms of, say, music um, or in terms of film. So in terms of how genres develop, genres develop when the same groups of conventions are put together a number of times. And this will be done if the product proves pro popular with audiences, as this will then make a profit and genres change according to the culture of the time and audience trends. So we see along the bottom of the slide here four films which all fit into the Western genre. So we see that hat um, in a couple of them. We see the poncho, we see the guns. Um, we see the cigar or the toothpick that is being chewed. Um, whereas on the fourth text, we see that this is perhaps a modernization. We see evidence of perhaps a labyrinth, evidence of Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian man with that man with his outspread, um, outstretched arms and legs at the bottom of the page. We see a woman holding the gun with a bandolier, so perhaps she is the cowgirl. And in the Django uh, Unchained, we see evidence of a black cowboy um, with several guns and blood spatters all over the page. Um, so that's kind of how genre evolves over time, depending on what audiences like and dislike. Um, so as we live in an age um, whereby we're on the third or fourth wave of feminism, we may now decide that we want to see female protagonists in our Western texts. So a genre is a type or a category of media text based on its codes and conventions. And remember conventions are the defining features of that genre. So once again, for vampires, it is castles, moon, bats, the night sky, the fangs, the blood, um, all of those things, the cape that indicate that genre. A subgenre though, is a more specific way of categorizing texts. So under the umbrella of horror, for example, we may have several subgenres. So we might have, uh, 
stuff like jigsaw or the human centipede which categorizes as torture porn or we may have um supernatural horror so stuff like the woman in black um and sinister or paranormal activity um or we may have thrillers um there are several different subgenres of that particular bigger genre and a hybrid genre is a text which then uses conventions of two or more media texts or forms so kiss of the vampire we could argue hybridizes romance and vampire we saw the same with um twilight where we hybridized um both horror and um the romance genres with that film so a hybrid is one that combines conventions of two or more texts and the process of this we call hybridization so it's important that you keep taking notes during these videos so that you can get this in your head you can go back and watch it again you can download it you can save it um, anything you want as long as you make sure that you are getting these terms into your head if you don't do it at this point you will start to feel overwhelmed by half term just because of the amount of terms that we start to cover um, by that point so uh, if you're in you'll have a key terms kahoot i will do this with you when you are in so we talk about codes and conventions a lot in this subject. Codes are the visual and technical elements that we associate with a genre, but they are also culturally understood. OK, so if we look at, say, the Django Unchained post that we just had, we saw that red splat uh, on the page, which is evocative or suggests um, a gunshot wound. Um, conventions, though, are the typical elements of a genre which the audience expects to see. Um, so that could come along with like typical narratives or storylines, um, any particular characters, so the protagonist, the antagonist, um, any situations, so for example, escaping from the castle in Kiss of the Vampire, um, and those codes plus conventions, plus what the audience expects to see, creates then an audience pleasure. So something about that text that we know we're going to enjoy, and that then will persuade us to go and watch this programme, this film, listen to this band, otherwise consume this text. So genre is important for producers. It is essential to the industry for producers because clearly establishing the genre of a text allows the producers to attract audiences and it is vital for the success of that text. From our side as an audience, we recognize the features of that genre and then we're attracted through what we recognize as repeated conventions as we then know what to expect and we go back for more of the same. The genre is made clear in marketing promotion, so we might see super suits in a Marvel poster, we might see stars in a sci-fi poster, we might see the colour pink in a rom-com poster. All that is made clear in the marketing and promotion and that is how we can gauge whether or not a text is successful. And the audience's pleasure is enhanced by recognising those genre conventions, which allows them to predict those narrative outcomes and anticipate how those stock characters will react. Um, so if we have a, a violent male whose daughter is taken away from him, we may expect that character to, um, to terminate people with what we call extreme prejudice. So basically kill everybody that is involved in the taking away of his daughter. So that's the basic plot of Taken with Liam Neeson. In terms of audiences, the audiences accept things in a text as long as they understand that it's part of that genre. So something like La La Land is credited with reinvigorating the musical genre in film because audiences understood right from the word go that it was accepted that the audience, uh, that the characters were going to suddenly burst into song. As well as that from the poster, we saw Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone dancing under the sky um, in LA. All of that lets us know what the narrative or what the genre of that text are. And then this explains the reliance of till film and TV productions um, on sequels and spin-offs. So these have guaranteed success rates. So we might see a franchise with um, a large number of films. So Harry Potter, for example, seven films um, or eight films. Um, we might see Back to the Future, a group of three, Batman, a group of three, um, Spider-Man, um, three films starring Tobey Maguire, two films starring Andrew Garfield. Um, all of these uh, tend to be based on what the audience enjoy. And so that guaranteed success 
um, means that the, the film or TV company is largely going to have um, a successful formula that's already been accepted by audiences. However, genre is fluid and changing, as we just saw with those four posters for those four Westerns. So based on changes in society, based on changes in what the audience want, audiences are going to want different things and they then may grow bored. Uh, in this case, producers are always looking for new formulas to adapt um, and they're always looking for existing ones in order to continue to attract audiences and reinvent themselves for new generations. So Steve Neal would call this repetition and difference. So in terms of character tropes, certain characters become associated through repetition with a specific genre. So Ryan Reynolds in the rom-com, um, we see that Jennifer Aniston in the rom-com, we see Lindsay Lohan in her teenage films. These can then be defined as stereotypes because they're linked to how the audiences respond to them. Um, stereotypes, as we know, Steve Neal says, are limited, um, overgeneralized representations of a particular group, a particular people. So the representation or the stereotype of all black males as criminal is a limited meaning that could be attributed to that stereotype. But characters in specific genres tend to have a function or a purpose, and then how the audience respond to them is very important to the success of the text. So we have here three films, Just Friends, Just My Look and The Breakup. Three films that had middling um, success as rom-coms, um, because the audience didn't really kind of respond to these pairings. Um, we didn't believe in these couples, whereas again, Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone have acted together two, three or four times um, and they're always kind of guaranteed to be successful. So in terms of stereotypes, as we were saying, Stuart Hall says that stereotypes were established through repetition, that they are exaggerated representations um, and particular groups are attributed with certain characteristics. Uh, these are often general, they are often broad, and they often are negative. Um, and they often become kind of the accepted representation that we then carry over into life from the texts that we've seen. So from hip hop music, painting, black men as criminal, that goes all the way back to the days of slavery and after the days of the abolition of slavery, where uh, from say 1915, for example, media texts, portrayed black men as criminals who poor, who preyed on, say, white women or gentle white people. Um, so those stereotypes are often simplified and judgmental. Very quickly, go through your notes for last week and tell me, what does Stuart Hall say about increasing the diversity of stereotypes? If you want to make some notes, that is absolutely fine, so we can ask you next time you're in. And in terms of genre, narrative um, usually tends to have a formulaic structure that is linked to that genre. So beginning, middle and end, or beginning, middle and cliffhanger, or beginning, middle and end where there is no narrative resolution. All of those plot situations are expected depending on the genre of the film. So we have come to expect, if we've ever been to see a Marvel film at the cinema, that there is going to be at least one scene in the end credits. Sometimes there's two, sometimes there's even three. There'll be one mid credits and there'll be one at the end of the credits, which ends us on a cliffhanger or lets us know what's going to happen in the next installation of the story. So as audiences, we are now familiar with the structure of that plot. Um, and we anticipate events and situations that will occur within the narrative. So for example, within the horror genre, specific narrative events reappear in different examples of the genre. So the male vampire, the female victim, perhaps the romance, perhaps the seduction, um, perhaps the vampires being incredibly wealthy because they've been alive for a long time. We expect to see those elements of the narrative appear in these texts. And in terms of iconography and setting, the genre is constructed in part by the mise-en-scene. Um, so the mise-en-scene always helps to define the genre and raises those audience expectations. Uh, and the iconography of a genre, so the symbolism and the visual codes of a genre, are subject cha to change depending on the technology, the budget, the cultural trends. Um, so if we're watching something with a huge mainstream budget, 
that will tend to have higher production values or more expansive iconography than something that's cheaper. So comparing, for example, Game of Thrones to something with a much smaller budget like, um, say, Doctor Who, for example. So the iconography of those genres is subject to change. Um, one example that's on the screen here is CSI, um, where they use a range of conventions such as white coats, steel tables, autopsies, metal instruments, to let the audience know what to expect. In terms of audience pleasures, these are the things that audiences enjoy by watching these genre texts. The first is a recognition of familiar conventions and character types, so that is your repetition. And part of this repetition means that we're also able to predict what is going to happen based on our previous experience of the genre. Now, Stuart Hall calls that cultural competence, and we'll be using that term a lot in coming lessons, so it's worth getting it down now. So based on our previous experience of the genre or experience of life in general, we call that cultural competence. We then might have a difference, so a twist, which is a manipulation of what we understand to be part of the genre, so repetition and difference. And as well as that, one audience pleasure is actually something called catharsis, which is where we purge our negative emotions. So if we're feeling sad, upset, angry, we might listen to music that helps us purge or get rid of that negative emotion. So either stuff that makes us feel angry until we are tired of feeling that way, or stuff that actively makes us feel the opposite way. Um, so that's catharsis. Now, binary opposites. Levi Strauss says that all texts have that underlying pair of structures, um, structure of opposites, and these pairs are constructed culturally and then taught to us as we interact with our environment. We know that producers use binary opposites in media texts to help the audience understand whose side we should be on in a genre text. However, as cultures change, these binaries can be broken, and this may be done because the producer wants to create more diverse stereotypes. So we're bringing together Levi Strauss and Stuart Hall in our study of genre here. So what I want you to do for me today is analyse genre in a text of your choice. So you can choose the John Wick one that came with the last lesson, or you can find one of your own. I want you to choose the poster for one of your favourite films or TV shows, paste it into a PowerPoint or Google Slides document, or stick it in your notebook. And I want you to annotate the poster, um, if you're using PowerPoint or slides, on the slide, and I'll show you how to do that next. Or if you're handwriting your analysis, annotate the poster in your book, and then send us a picture so that we can gauge that you've done the work and the level of your understanding as well. So consider first the expected conventions of the genre. So what repetition do we see here and how and why has that been used? Are there any changes or hybridization of the original genre? Is there any evidence of using or breaking binary opposites and why has this been done? In terms of bringing a narrative theory, can you guess the narrative of the text from the conventions shown in the poster? And then always consider the media languages. So color, props, costume, the lighting, the settings, the facial expression, the anchorage, the language, and the mode of address. So who's being spoken to? How are they speaking? Um, do we have direct mode of address where the camera is being addressed by the star? Or do we have indirect mode of address where the star is not looking at the camera? And the example I've chosen here is Johnny English. So let's have a look. Um, we have Johnny English reborn here. So we have the explosion plus the tuxedo. And we understand both of those to mean secret agent because we've been exposed to that conventions or that set of conventions for many, many years through franchises such as James Bond. We then have that gun, but rather than a bullet, there is a joke flag um, rather than bullets, which suggests this is going to be a parody of the secret agent genre. So we're hybridizing action secret agent with comedy. Reborn lets the audience know this is a reboot or a sequel of an existing character and as such they can expect repetition of existing conventions. So if they liked Johnny English, they might then like Johnny English Reborn. Um, we have an us versus them binary, so a little intelligence goes a long way. We understand that we are supposed to be on the side of Johnny English um, and that as a secret agent, he'll be finding out some information about a villain. Um, the audience is expected to know who Johnny English is. So we're expected to know that this character is played by this actor, Rowan Atkinson, that the confused facial expression is all part of how this character is built and that they may then choose to consume this film based on whether or not they enjoy this genre. And then, as we're saying, there is evidence of hybridization with conventions of the secret agent, action and comedy genres.
Um, if you can get me the narrative as well from that, that would be great. So here we can see that perhaps there's an explosion behind him. We see from his confused facial expression that he may have been the cause of that explosion or that he perhaps doesn't understand why it's happening um, or that he's done it by mistake. Uh, and that this then indicates to us that this is going to be a comedy film. We can also see that he is slanted in the frame, so perhaps he is not quite as uh, dashing or quite as adept as other characters like James Bond. Okay, so that is your narrative theory um, lesson for today. I need you to go back, watch it again if you need to, and then you need to do this text for us and hand it in by the end of your second lesson. Thank you.